Okay, we'll make a start because I'm just going to do a very brief intro. So if anyone else is, is still wanting to join, that's... So um, just as a bit of background, um, we were often asked, well, we, on a very regular basis, asked the question, what does all the different interventions that I do mean in relation to affecting the number of stem larvae? Um, we've never managed to create small block piles that have been of any benefit in this respect. So we took the view that, um, and bear in mind this is nothing to do with establishment, but we're going to talk about cover crops, companion crops and all those sorts of things, but there's a lot of good work going on being done by other people on establishment. And the, the money that we have from DEFRA, one of the provisos on it, is that we don't, A, repeat work being done elsewhere, um, or, or copy it. So this is this type of idea, looking at the stem larval numbers and focusing on that, is to be complementary to all the work being done uh, with establishment. So we took the view that we would try and get samples from larger fields so that we had a better understanding as to how things were operating geographically, date-wise in a whole range of crops. So um, you'll all be familiar those who took part, for which we're very grateful. We actually sent out just under 800 sample packs and 577 came back, um, which is a good percentage. Um, so that's given us a lot of numbers to play with. So each of those samples was distributed to either Hampshire, Cambridge or uh, Sirencester. And they were all then dehydrated over water uh, which was a method that Syngenta developed several years ago. We've modified it slightly to suit us um, because we find, although that takes quite a long time and is, is fairly labour intensive, we find that gives us a more uniform count than having a whole range of different people dissecting it in a different way. So um, in some cases, it was several weeks for them to, to dehydrate properly. The larvae then fall into water um, and then we can actually strain them out of that and count them quite easily. So we completed all that. Um, my colleague Joe is going to run for a presentation as to where we've got. So this is an early look at the, at the big set of numbers. Um, we will be picking some individual bits out as time goes on, but we wanted to try and get whatever we found out to you as fast as we could. Um, and I think he finished you know, the numbers in the afternoon. So this is as quick as we can. Um, what we want from this is A, to show you basically what we've got, B, to explain where we think we're going to go. But we also want questions, we want feedback. This is all about trying to find small ways to help growers to produce a more reliable crop in the presence of a pest that is not going to go away. We're not going to create a cure but there might be things that we can find that will help us. Um, so if you've got any ideas, questions or anything, you can either put them in the chat or shout at us today. Joe will do a short presentation. Um, I'm then going to follow up just with two slides at the end. And then after that, we can have a quick question and answer, but we're aware that everyone is, so we don't want to make it too long. So all being well, Joe is there. So some of you don't know Joe, he's going Naya this year. Did this year or last year? Uh, last year. Last year, sorry. Um, and Joe's very kindly looked at all the figures for us and uh, he's now going to do a presentation. I will. Hopefully you can see my screen, Colin. Not yet. Coming. There we go. Oh. Cool. So, as Colin said, yeah, it's... um. It's an enormous data set um, and I've just had time to have a quick look really and just run a few sort of very basic sort of comparisons and stuff just for a sort of a quick look see. Um, the first thing to sort of caveat everything that we're going to say is that it is a one year's worth of sort of survey data sets. There's not that kind of time replication and there's not that sort of controlled site replication that we would look to to be able to draw sort of strong conclusions from field trials. Um, but as Colin's alluded to, that's problematic with flea beetle anyway. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we go through. So as Colin said, it's, it was a large data set. So we've got 577 sample points back. Um, I've managed to 
plot 417 on that map over there because uh, quite a lot of them didn't have um, location data along with them. The mean amount of larvae was 81, but the range was zero all the way through to 645. Um, so quite a, quite a large range, 46 different varieties and drill dates spanning from the 28th of July right through to the 30th of September. So that shows the, the sort of the massive sort of difference in practice across the UK. Plus or minus uh, a variety of management approaches, um, bits and pieces that we do. Oh, somebody's got their hand up already. Did you want to say something, Andrew? Thank you. Only a point of clarification, 0 to 645. The results were given to us in total of the 10 plants. Is that per plant or per 10 plants? That's per, per 10, 10 plants. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that would have been excellent. We could have published that, Colin, if it was 645. Um, Plus or minus variety of management approaches, variety of companion crops, and a variety of defoliation approaches. So it's quite a complicated sort of survey data set. If you look at the regional distribution, just to start with, of the larvae, um, so you've got the map there, and you've got the larvae, sort of anything in sort of yellow green, it's high larvae count, anything sort of very dark colours is low, and anywhere sort of bluey green is in the middle. You can see that there isn't really a pattern for the distribution across the UK. Um, you know, if you look down in England there, you can see that there are, you know, there's, those colours are sort of spread across. We do see, you see those very high numbers over in the west, the sort of the northwest Midlands and into probably the top of Wales there, wherever the border is. North of Yorkshire, generally the lower numbers, but that's the only trend that I can sort of see visually from that. And we can do some a little bit more sort of further analysis, actually sort of looking into that rather than me just having a look. As Colin said, they were divided into sort of three of us where we processed the samples, basically Cambridgeshire, Sirencester and Sutton Scotney. However, in reality, the, the samples, the, the ones that came from Sirencester actually included all those high samples from Wales and some of the ones that came from Sutton Scotney included low from Lincolnshire. So this is a bit of a sort of a, just again, a quick look see, but there, there was a significant difference, mainly due to those high samples that came in from that sort of Northwest Midlands area and um, that came into the Sirencester population slightly lower in Cambridge and Sutton Scotney, um, but it reflects that enormous sample distribution. So, so really, you know, this map is much more meaningful than, than having a look at the data this way. I tried to have a look at just a few agronomic sort of, um, you know, practices, obviously in the data set, they're, they're really, really detailed. So I've just tried to broaden them out so that we could just have a really quick look at what perhaps made a difference or not. So I went for early and late drilling to start with and just picked the sort of the bank holiday type weekend cut off as something that represented that. And we do see across the whole sample that drilling earlier, i.e. earlier than 30 August, puts you at a risk of a slightly higher larval load at this time of year when we've counted them compared to drilling after that. That's probably something that we knew anyway. And then when you look at the different regional distributions, we start to see that again. So for Sutton Scott Neo, we saw the same pattern. And for Cambridge, we saw the same pattern, but not Sirencester. Varietal type, um, haven't had time to look at all of the varieties and do some ranking and that sort of thing yet, but for the purposes of time, I just had a look at conventional and hybrid because of the stories that we that we know and that we practice about establishment and, and vigour and all that sort of stuff in the autumn and in the spring and a, a, a establishment. So annoyingly, when you look at it in the big picture, conventional varieties had a high larval count at Sutton Scotney, which perhaps you would sort of think, hey, you know, maybe sort of hybrid vigour and all that sort of stuff makes makes sense. But then at some of the other sites like Sirencester, you see the opposite trend. Um, to me, perhaps that's to do with those slightly high, you know, those hybrid varieties being slightly bigger um, in those more forward regions down in the west as comparison to some of those ones at Sutton Scotney that would have come in from sort of maybe North Lincolnshire, which would be slightly slower. Um, but I'll have to drill down to the data set to, to try and sort of pick out what's actually happening there. But from the quick look, um, that looks quite messy at the moment. So hopefully we'll get something better when we start to pick out the varieties specifically. When we look at the management practices that were laid over the top of that, again, there's, there's a million and one variables in the data set because it was a free bit of text. So everybody's written something differently um, over all 577 samples. So I just went yes and no for companion crop, just for a quick look. Um, and we don't see a significant difference, um, you know, slightly less for the no, but actually, you know, when you look at the, the graph on the right and the, the outliers, you can see that they're, they're pretty much the same sort of distribution. Defoliation, we didn't have that many. Companion cropping was quite quite a similar number between yes and no, but defoliation, we, we didn't have very many defoliation yes samples. Um, only 12 people and, and 469 people who didn't. Um, so not really a fair comparison, but you know, from, from the data there, you can see the ones that did defoliate um, slightly less and the ones that, that didn't slightly more. 
Um, but it would be, yeah, unfair to do a statistical comparison on that basis. When I looked at the interactions quickly between the treatments, so now what we're thinking of is, you know, if you do a certain variety and a certain drilling date, do, do those things start to sort of work together? Um, and is there anything you can pick apart? And unfortunately, the story in the large data set um, at this point is that there isn't really an interaction between things. So, for example, here, um, if you see my pointer, you know, conventional hybrid, if we then twin that with early and late, we don't then see a pattern that, you know, picking a conventional and always drilling early provides you a certain advantage as opposed to, you know, picking a hybrid and always drilling late. Um, we see the same with I've put companion cropping and, and uh, conventional hybrid as an example there. And again, we see the data set is quite, quite similar. And lastly, if we look at, I started to then go into the data set into in more detail, which needs which needs doing further, as Colin said, but there's lots and lots of different individual practices within the data set that would be really interesting to look at. Um, so I've just picked out four here. So we've got long stubble, yes and no. We've got the type of companion crop. So rather than just saying yes or no, a companion crop, you know, does the type of companion crop make a difference? We've got the establishment method down the bottom here. So direct drilling and, and anything else. So I was more interested in if we moved the soil or if we didn't. And then establishment, um, stuff that we do at establishment is try and get the plants off the ground quicker, basically. So organic matter or starter fertilizer were the two that came up quite a lot. And unfortunately, again, at this stage, um, we don't have any significant differences in here. So with long stubble, we see that they are actually quite similar. With companion type, we see that not having a companion seems to have quite a lot of these large outliers, these really high level count numbers, and, and perhaps having a companion um, as we pick this apart differently, we might be able to learn something in there. With the establishment method, moving soil doesn't really seem to make a huge amount of difference. Again, a lot of the outliers are in, in the category where we have moved the soil, but that doesn't really tell us anything at this stage. And, and lastly, with the establishment method, so we've got no, we've got, did you apply organic matter at the start or did you apply a starter fertilizer? And again, counting at this stage doesn't seem to make a difference. That's not to say that that didn't make a difference in the establishment and actually getting a crop away in the first place. You know, that it might have made a significant difference at that time of year, and it might have not ever succeeded and become a crop for us to count at this time of year due to one of those factors. But we're just looking at the, the larval counts, as Colin said, rather than that establishment. So from my very, very quick uh, look at the data so far, um, I think what we can say is that we've got, you know, that very geographical distribution and there doesn't seem to be a sort of a clear pattern. So that's encouraging and not encouraging in a way because we can, as we know already, we can throw away all of those assumptions that we don't get such high flea beetle pressures as we move further north and all that sort of stuff, as we can see from the map. Drilling early increased level number, but I think we knew that already. Um, and then we, we have all those management practices that allow us to sort of do that with establishment. Hybrid and conventional varieties have no effect on the level number at this time. As I've just said, they might have, have had a fantastic effect to establishing the crop and actually getting one there in the first place. Um, but, you know, larval numbers at this time, it didn't make a significant difference. And then there were some trends from those management approaches like we just had a quick look at, um, but it's difficult to draw any conclusions from, from this sort of data. And it really needs sitting and picking apart and sitting, making averages and stuff like that to be able to understand that a little bit better. So hopefully we can, we can do that for you when we produce the report. That's me, Colin. Thank you, Joe. Um, All right. So, um, as Joe said, at the moment, there's uh, we, we wanted to try and get um, if there'd been any real big take home messages, uh, we wanted to get it out quickly. Hence, we booked this meeting a while ago. Um, because there isn't a big take home message in what you've seen this morning, doesn't mean to say there's not bits and pieces in there. There are some interesting in where we've got sets of data from individual farms, things like where we've got two different drilling dates in the same uh, data set. So we need to go back to some of uh, the people who um, uh, submitted the samples and find out how close uh, where they were geographically. But we, we will be mapping most of them. Most of them we got a what three words for. So we can actually do some of that ourselves. But we are seeing some interesting differences in some data sets where you've got two different drilling mates, which turns some of what common knowledge is on its head, where in some cases the later drilled plants, where they're adjacent to early drilled plants, have got much higher larval numbers. Um, we will be looking into that 
steps uh, and we will be setting up some form of trialing to look at that as to whether or not um, some form of trap crop drilled later as opposed to earlier might have a beneficial aspect to it. Um, so there's there's quite a few bits and pieces in there that we want to tease out to try and do that and try and do that fairly quickly so that we can actually get that into a more organized trial status this year. Um, one of the other things we are doing as well to complement all of this is trying to understand the life cycle in the wider environment. Um, <clears throat> much of the understanding of the life cycle was, was undertaken many years ago. And we do find that sometimes things evolve and change a little bit. So we're revisiting that. Um, you'll be several of you will be aware we did do some emergence trapping last autumn uh, we're expanding that so we've got some uh, an additional DEFRA project where we're, we're expanding that this year we're having a lot more trap built um, so that we can try and understand the actual emergence pattern and for those I'll just share my screen for those of you who are not familiar with what emergence trap looks like Hopefully, can you see that? Yeah, cool. So these are emergence traps, the things that look like TARDISes, these ones are kindly lent to us by Rothenstein. Um, and then you'll see the familiar water traps in the middle. So these, this two, these two traps were not that far from Cambridge. Um, and This graph shows you the emergence pattern that we had in that particular uh, season last year. So the two highest humps are two sites not that far apart. So David White, this is your one, the blue one. Um, and this is up the road at Thriplow. So that orange one, we picked up the equivalent of 2 million adults per hectare emerging from mid-August to mid-October, and we were on a rising plane of emergence when we took the traps in. And the reason we took the traps in was the weather was starting to get them. Um, so we're going to expand on this to try and understand how this works, because we, we're very, very interested in the volunteer crops, because um, for many years we, we've, we've accepted they're a useful trap crop. They also produce a nice bit of vegetation, so they're all good. Um, but we wonder whether or not there's, there's more we can do with the volunteer crop because where, we are, where we've been monitoring in volunteers, we're not catch, picking up anywhere near the level of activity that we would expect to see. Um, and so we are going to be looking at what other things we can do, as I say, that links in with some of this data we've just got back with seeing the smaller plants with higher larval numbers when they're drilled later adjacent to smaller ones. So there might be something in there that we can do. Um, uh, and so that, as I say, the, the emergence traps, we're gonna start catching from hopefully somewhere in June in this year's rape crops. We have actually got emergence traps out already this year in first weeks, just to see if we do get a, a, a form of spring hatch. So, like I say, there's quite a lot in there. Um, we're going to continue to uh, play around with those numbers to see if there's anything else we can find. And anything we do find, the group of emails that I've got, we will be sending stuff out as soon as we possibly, you know, if we see anything useful, we'll send it straight out to you. Um, any questions? We've got quite a few questions. So winter stem weevil, um, we're not looking at specifically. Um, it's something that we are aware in certain regions is increasing. So, but within this project, we've only got money to actually look at look at cabbage stem flea beetle. Uh. The um, uh, the Craig's question, Craig. No, we. We didn't, it's the manpower meant with the, the work that was going on with those samples, we were only able to basically do the count. Um, we've actually taken some more samples in this week where we are doing the biomass because they're on, they're on smaller ones and they're samples from where we've got larger plants and smaller plants grown next to each other in the same field. Um, 
are the large number of outliers in one of the grass establishment methods simply due to the larger number of samples in that category? There's some and some, Stephen. So some of the graphs here, that, that will be a factor, the, un, the uneven group sizes, but some of them are actually quite equal. Um, and it's just those, it's that huge distribution and that uneven distribution between sort of, you know, if you look at the histogram, there's a lot of small numbers up to that sort of 80 point, and then there's quite a long tail. Um, so yeah, you're right, it needs sort of sorting through and deciding what, what to do with that and how to deal with that. Um, Thanks. Andrew, the, um, so the 10 plants are dehydrated as a bulk, so we didn't, didn't look at individual plants. The idea is to just get a general feel for um, it, the, the, we just get a total for the 10 plants. Um, are we going to follow up with yield data? What we're going to do is to contact some, we're going to send an email out to everyone who sent stuff in because not everyone has yield data. We're not going to be doing um, yield data, so these are all from commercial fields. But where people who have helped us with the, the samples, where they have got yield data, we will ask for it so that we can actually see if we can tie anything together there. But that will be farm-based, either Weybridge or combine data. Uh, Craig, your results were sent out last Saturday. And I sent them to the lady who um, gave them to me. Is there any effect of air temp on emergent to cabbage temp leafage in August? I don't know, that's the sort of thing that I don't know um, if anyone ADAS wise is here because I believe they'd be able to answer that question, Hannah. Um, but I don't know, it's not something we're looking at. Um, on a going back to anecdotal small batches of data, there is a there is a crop in Cambridge or very near Cambridge where we generally been picking up quite high numbers that you would call a true companion crop, um, which some of you have seen pictures of. And where we had a companion crop that was drilled as a companion crop and established before the rate went into it, and that companion crop was still there going, you know, at Christmas, and you could barely see the rate. Right now it looks quite good and the numbers are incredibly low. So that's only one field, but that is a very, very, that's different to just a bit of buckwheat that then got scorched off with the frost. That's 16 different plant species. Andrew, your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was just thinking about the, very, the wide range in the data you've got, the, the, the very high numbers in certain cases. Um, well, whilst the statisticians will probably um, uh, grumble, um, could you maybe divide the data set into, into a high and a low population data set uh, and see whether there's any variation in the treatments between those who are, which are expressing very high larval loads and those expressing very low larval loads? And, and, and whilst, it, you know, it's an imperfect data set anyway, so I, it did, I did wonder, because in an individual high number in any particular cohort is going to completely ruin your average. It's the, the joyous of doing data analysis on stuff like this, yeah, on the survey data. But yeah, there's there's ways of dealing with that and there's various ways. Um, so I'll, yeah, depending on what Colin wants to do and what the what the group's interested, really, we can we can either do that some sort of um, geo statistically by sort of dividing the region. There's ways to do it like that. Um, or there's slightly more traditional ways that we, we can have a go at doing it as well. So, yeah, we're, depending on what everybody wants to do and what everybody's interested in, and I'll, I'll, um, I can get on with that. Jeremy, in answer to your question, as much as is humanly possible, uh, they were cabbage in the beetle larvae. We're not saying that there wasn't the odd stem larvae in there, but um, as much as humanly possible, that's they were cabbage in the beetle. We basically straighten them out through that material, so they're very easy to identify and count. Um, we will distribute these slides and we will carry on distributing, as I said earlier. Um, anything that we do find that we think might be of help us, you know, we'll get it out as fast as possible. If we look at how much penetration of plants had occurred by larvae, no, these basically, all, we, all we've got the funds to do is basically get them in, dehydrate them and, and count them out. It is a shame when you get that many samples coming in, it's a, it's a lot of labour to deal with it. Um, and it is a shame that we can't pick them apart and do all sorts of other things, but we have a very limited amount of
Andrew, question again? No. Uh, no. Uh, well, yeah, actually, I forgot to lower my hand, and I was just going to put it up again. So, <laughs> <laughs> do you have any anecdotal data uh, in relation to the level of adult feeding damage this season? Uh, or is it that we are at all tending to go a bit earlier and missing these peaks of emergence and having better establishment than we might otherwise have in previous years? We don't have anything to benchmark it against. Anecdotally, everyone seems fairly happy, bar some individuals with the way crops look at the moment. So it will be interesting if we can get a form of yield data to, to benchmark against what we know are numbers in certain areas. Um, we have got some more uh, samples that were defoliated that were kindly provided for us last week from the, well, from here. Um, again, it's a small number, but these are ones that have been defoliated since, uh, and they've been grazed. since We took the original samples. Um, so we'll have a bit more data there. Um, but one of the things we do want to do is to try and understand the, the hatching, the emergence pattern. So we're, we're catching adults coming out of the ground. They may already have hatched and have estivated in the ground. We don't know. Personally, I'm not overly bothered. They are emerging. End of. Um, if we can understand that better, and if we can relate that to drilling dates and other bits and pieces going on, we might be able to get into a position where we can forecast numbers whether you whether you're in for a good year or a bad year and that's one of the targets that we want to try and get to. uh george uh, um do we have any thoughts other than on this trial on numbers of larvae that fail succeed in penetrating stems uh, again, that's detailed work that, again, I think you will find the ADAS project we're looking at more. Um, and is there any data regarding if an insecticide was used or not? No. Um, partly Most, because... There is some in the in, some, in our yeah. data set, but it's not full, which is the issue then for making any comparisons, because some people have written it in and some people haven't. But the majority of the area where those samples came from, we would strongly advise that pie reef are a complete waste of time. Um, we know there's a, a very, very large amount of resistance about. Um, interestingly, it does look like pie reef would still work in the north of Scotland. So the ones in Aberdeenshire were forecasting very, very high adult, not forecasting, um, they, they reported very, very high adult levels. Uh, small amounts of pyrethroids were used and we got 10 plants, 10 counts of one, two and three. Obviously that did work. Um, Robert, following on from that point, are you looking at linking larval numbers from the previous crop or region and then cabbage stem flea beetle emerge? We're gonna try and link the whole lot together over time. Um, and we want to try and link the uh, stem lark. We want to be a bit more targeted. So this was a big look, see as to, we, 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 we haven't got the funds to do this again, um, but what we want to do is to be a lot more targeted and link it to actual emergence figures. Um, hence, we've got the extra DEFRA project on, on looking at the actual established, the emergence pattern and to try and find out if that is uniform across regions over years. We've only got a couple of years to do it. But again, that might point us in a direction of understanding better how we actually manage what's coming out of the ground when. So we're going to do all sorts of things with volunteer crops this year, which we're just planning at the moment. But we wanted to get this data set to see if there's anything in it that would help us make those decisions. If anyone's got any ideas as to how you would um manage or how you you if, if you want to partake in our decision making process as to what we're physically going to do this year we would welcome any input it's a bit of a brainstorming session um it's a, we've got a very limited time scale that we want to try and deliver stuff that will help um would it be interesting to see the outcome of the crop with extreme number 
645,000, huge, they were huge plants, I'll be honest. Um, so these are ones uh, that we got at Christmas in Shropshire. They were very, very big plants. Um, could you let us know what the multi-species companion crop in the example you mentioned? I can, we can ask Martin. I will find out for you. Would we be exploring the effect of beneficial insects where insecticides not being used over a number of years in presence of habitat? I wish. Uh, we all love to think that that type of thing will help, um, but that's that's a completely different set of work and there's a lot of beneficial monitoring going on, George. There were various multi-species cover crops as well in the data set. Um, there was a good number of, of people using some sort of companion or cover or you know, some sort of something that would fall into that category. So yeah, from a quick comparison, I just did yes and no. Um, but yeah, there's rather than just breaking it down by brassica and non brassica we could, what I want to do is have a look farm by farm um, and see if we can start to sort of pick anything interesting out. But it depends how much time Colin's going to let me do on this much as you like the um that that particular crop is martin lines uh and it's partly a soil regen trial and partly a rape crop um but he very kindly let us play in it and we're going to follow it through and look at yield where it's been mown or herbicides been put on and various different bits and pieces but um it's it's the only one that we've got to my knowledge in this data set that i would call a true companion crop because those there was 16 species um, and a lot of it's still there. So, like I say, if anyone's got any comments um, or, or suggestions or want to get involved in, in any brainstorming that we do, we are currently planning what we're going to do this autumn because it, the project that we're doing is not a fixed one it's it's evolving to try and understand what we can do so we'll be running it alongside this whole emergence pattern thing because what what we picked up last autumn goes against what you read in the literature and we need to see if that is real and happens again over a wider area um so we want to be very targeted in that and we've now got some good background figures of, of numbers um and we're also going to be trying to understand a little bit more about the uh, what we might be able to do, as I say, with the volunteer or around the whole idea of, of flat cropping adjacent to or in the volunteer crop. So there'll be a lot of work going on in volunteers this year. Be interesting to look at what previous cropping and if it's we uh, lots of mid spray was applied before. Yeah, I mean all. All of these things, if we had millions of pounds, we'd love to do a massive monitoring of, of everything. Um, we will go back to, as I say, some of the, one of the advantages of this set of data, we can actually have a chat with some of the high numbers and some of the low numbers and some of the, some of the interesting ones so that we can actually individually ask those questions. We can't do it as a, uh, a global thing. Um, but we can be very targeted and we will be going through all of this with a fine tooth and to see if there's, and, and we've already picked out some specific ones that are interesting and buck trends. Um, and we want to understand how those, you know, why those trends happen on those particular parts. Orange blossom ridge spray, it's not one I've thought of before, but thank you, it's a question that we can ask people. So if there's, if no one's got any other questions, we'll let you all go. Um, thank you very much for your time. And for those of you who did uh, send samples in, thank you very much. Uh, I'm aware that two or three of you want a bit more information on your particular samples. I hope to get out today um, because we have kept all your, we've obviously kept all the sheets that you sent in. Um, so we'll get that out to you. And if anyone's got anything else, um, George has got another question. The reason we are sowing early is to offset the risk of adult attack destroying the crop before it gets This leads to higher levels of larva numbers, but bigger plants may be better able to withstand later larval attack. Any idea how we find the sweet spot of sowing? Crop husband is moisture, 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 moisture. Um, 
no is the answer at this point in time. Um, I, I just did the end of August as my sort of look see, you know, early, late, quick comparison in my head, but I, I'll have a look and order them by date and see if that sort of produces something interesting, George. Yeah. Martin, I didn't realise you were here. Martin, do you want to tell us what was in that cover crop mix? Yep, sorry, I was on a call with that earlier. Um, uh, so it was, I don't think it was, what was in it? Uh, buckwheat, radish, uh, sunflower, linseed, uh, black oats, uh, and uh, there's a whole list of everything in there. And then it's all under sown with white, small leaf white clover as well. Um, and we drilled straight into it and terminated different parts in different ways with different herbicides, which is also given interesting results because the piece we used in autumn herbicide to terminate some of the cover crop in the autumn looks, it had the worst pigeon damage and it will yield the worst to the line of where we applied the herbicide. So there's there's lots to learn from it. But yeah, but the more we can be uh, use it as a trial, the better. Hmm. Thank you. Um, They, I mean, go, going back to the drilling day, geographically, you know, we're talking to a lot of growers all over the place, and the West Country, the Southwest, the Northeast, it, it varies so much depending on um, where you are as to how late you can risk going. Um, you know, there's a lot of people, as Andrew will know, down in Kent now, where you seem to be getting the moisture a bit later. So, you know, right, would you agree, Andrew? I mean, right, right down the bottom there, um, a lot of people are drilling a lot later now because that's when the moisture appears to be, um, well, that's when the rain appears to be coming later. Um, so geographically, those, those who are successfully establishing rape have, have worked out how to do it. Um, Quite how it relates to the later stem larval numbers, we will hopefully be able to point fingers at the emergence patterns once we understand them a bit better. Andrew. Andrew? Yeah, I was just thinking um, going forward, you've got a, a very interesting sort of cluster group here of people who've participated in this um, in this. Uh, Larval count very enthusiastically. Um, I'm sure that they'd be, they would, would along with others, be a very ready audience to, to give you some more feedback in other aspects uh, mm. for next for the next autumn. I was thinking of one particular issue. You might be, you, it's easy to do with Google Maps now. You could say send in uh, the distance to your nearest um, previous crop, for example, um, particularly if it was uh, downwind. It, we can do that so easily now. We don't quite know how far, well, we know how far they can fly. We don't quite know that part of it. That's just one sort of question that you could ask as a suite of questions uh, going forward. And I'm sure we'd all be very keen to um, to participate now we've got started. Yeah, good idea. As I say, we, we, will, we will certainly talk to some individuals and we will ask the yield question and, and have various other bits and pieces. So, um, uh, autumn nitrogen use over MVZ restrictions seems to be the general consensus for local supper growers as to how to get past the issue. Is that this jab? Is that the establishment issue, Jeremy? Or um, because we've we've not done any looking at nutrition and stem larval numbers, um, what what withstand? You know what plants withstand? Uh, larger numbers we don't know anything about it we, we don't have detailed information we did pick out varieties last year of interest where it looked like we had preferential what i call preferential egg laying so we had varieties in in trials nothing they weren't cabbage stem flea beetle trials they were variety trials. so where it looked like certain varieties were getting hit harder and had more larvae in them we drilled those in large blocks, 90 degrees to other varieties to see if that still occurred. And what we did find, unfortunately, is that the larval numbers even out over the whole lot. So there was nothing to be gained from 
with those particular varieties, there was nothing to be gained from using one variety as a companion crop in a field of rape. Um, we will continue to look for varieties of interest. And again, we might see some bits and pieces out of this data when we pull it apart, but there's nothing, there's, there's no one variety standing out as A, this one withstands attack or B, it's resistant to egg laying or anything like that. That's a good point, Hannah. Um, uh, distance to wildlife strips to see in natural predators. So there's there's a lot of AHDB work going on looking at natural predators. Perhaps we could tap into some of that. Um, totally agree, Robert. It, it's it does appear to be from from what I see, it does appear to be. The, the structure of the plant um, and just where it happens to be when we get this emergence. So um, I, I actually think understanding the emergence is quite key to understanding how that all links in with the plants and how uniform the emergence is across the country. We don't know, but we're looking to, to understand that. Martin. Yeah, just to... Uh... Uh, add a bit of interest in it. Uh, our oil sea rape last year that we harvest was a volunteer crop from the previous year that was almost destroyed by flea beetle. We took to harvest at terrible yield. We left it as a cover crop. We never got the winter wheat in, yet we took it to harvest and it was one of our best rape crops. So it was a volunteer rape crop grown from a crop that was almost destroyed from flea beetle, yet we end up with the best so I think proximity to a, an old, you know, last year's crop is an interesting thinking because we are found in the same field, we get a better return. Not that I'd recommend people doing it, but it worked for us at you. I'll just, um, I'm just going to, on, on that front, just for amusement. So going back to these emergence traps, those two traps picked up your equivalent of 2 million a hectare. The water traps that we use to catch, um, so the, the picture at the bottom left is the top of the emergence trap, we've shown some of the adult flea beetles in the water in the top of the emergence trap. Those two water traps didn't catch one adult whilst we were catching 2 million coming out of the ground. Um, it's why we're interested, and, and it sort of links to what Martin's just said, um, we're not 100% sure how flea beetles do react to the volunteers that they've just emerged from. That's something we want to try and understand. Um, in that instance, they all seem to be leaving the field at a rapid rate of knots because we weren't, we couldn't find any damage whilst we were able to prove that they were coming out of the ground because we were physically catching them in the emergency trap. So all of, the, all of those two million a hectare were leaving the field very rapidly. And that's, that's the type of thing we want to try and understand um, and how that links to the type of story that Martin just said so that we can understand a little bit more what we might do with the volunteers. So Andrew's had exactly the same experience as Martin, but we lack conviction to carry the crop on and we drilled the wheat as planned. I'm resending an email. Okay. Um, is keeping volunteers a red herring? I'm convinced that we need to understand more about what the adults are doing when they come out the ground and what they do when they come out the ground. Um, and, and as I say, we started this last year looking at volunteer volunteers properly and we're not picking up anywhere near the level of activity that we would want to see if they were acting as a good trap crop and we want to understand that and if they're not acting as a good trap crop now it all depends on how you look at the numbers because other projects have suggested that on occasions they are a brilliant trap crop 
all we're doing is physically looking at the adults in the field. We're not comparing it with anything else. We're just physically looking to see what they're doing. If they're not staying there, can we actually entice them to be somewhere else? That's, that's the type of thing that we want to have a look at. Uh, so Robert, we tried manipulating volunteers. So Robert's asked, getting the right growth stage of a volunteer sown in July. Uh, too big compared to, to um, volunteers in cultivated sown mid August later. That's the type of thing we're looking at. We did try to manipulate the growth of oil seed rape volunteers last year to get fresh growth later on. You can't do it because they just die. They're very easy to die. Um, and that you only have to basically wave a herring at them and they just drop dead. So manipulating the existing volunteer plants doesn't work. We will, we're hoping to look at putting fresh volunteers in volunteer crops and elsewhere and actually monitoring, monitoring the adult numbers and then linking that with the numbers that we know are emerging in the landscape. So the light cultivation, uh, Mark suggests that we're better off leaving the rape stubbles untouched after harvest or giving the field a light cultivation. Um, we don't think that cultivation will affect the emergence of the adults that, that graph I showed you, but we're aiming to find out. So yeah, we'll that's why I wanted to have a look at the direct drill versus everything else. And then actually in the data set, there's loads of nice sort of autocast versus subcast versus proper subsoiling versus traditional cultivation. So we can have a have a look at that and see if there's a, anything interesting in that. But we're also going to be looking at cultivations in the volunteer crop because we have anecdotal evidence as to where people draw rake to reduce slug numbers in the volunteers. We picked up, in, again, in, in emergence traps. So emergence traps physically, anything that comes out from underneath them, we picked up lower numbers in field where straw rakes were used to reduce slug number. That's something we're going to look at. I don't believe that we can come up with a strategy of cultivations. So if you do this to your volunteer crop on X date, you will delay the adults emerging. We don't know if, we, we don't expect that to be the case. Um, we don't look, we don't find out. So that's, the, that's part of the story we're going to be looking into this year. Um, so if we can have enough emergence traps out there, we know what's coming out of the ground. Are there things we can do at that point to A, entice them elsewhere, or B, do something to affect the emergence? I don't think you can affect the emergence, but if we don't try, we won't find out. Andrew, uh, so, you know, is it intuitive that a cultivation of a previous rate field will mechanically disturb the adult developing and emerging? That's, that's what we're going to look at. I don't believe it to be the case. Um, and we've also got to be aware that in these emergence traps, the, the, the amount of beneficials that you catch in traps like that is huge. So if we want to start running around trying to delay the adults, are we actually doing more harm than good? And again, we need to actually understand that properly. And that's a big so hopefully that's of use um if anyone's got any other questions you've all got our email you've got our contact details we will send the slides out um and we will make this available to those who couldn't make it this morning um as i say if anyone's got any other questions thoughts comments all welcome. It's it, at the moment. It's it's a very movable feast, and we're just trying to understand practical things that we can that we can do that will will give us a bit of an edge. Um, and like I say, we're not looking at establishment. We're just concentrating on this. So if we can understand this, and we can understand the emergence pattern, I, I'm sure there are some bits and pieces in there that, that we can actually roll out. The So with that, thank you very much indeed, um, and have a good day. Thank you.